let's meditate. Kanam Pavana. Close your eyes and be aware of your breath. Take a couple of good, long, deep in and out breaths. And notice where the feeling of breathing is most prominent in the body. Focus your attention there. And then try to stay there. And you can notice the mind wandering off. Just bring it right back. Ask yourself what kind of breathing would feel good now. The breath is one of the few processes in the body that you can control. And so why not make use of that ability to make it a good place to stay? Choose some spot in the body that is sensitive to how the breathing feels. And ask yourself exactly how long would be just right. How deep, how heavy, how fast, how slow. And if you're not sure, you can experiment with different ways of breathing for a while and see what feels best. The important thing is that you learn how to observe your own mind, observe your own breath. This principle applies all the way through the practice of the Dharma. There's a spot where the Buddha says, the Dharma is nourished in your mind by two things. One is committing yourself to the practice, and then two, reflecting on what the results are. If the results are good, then you keep it up. If they're not good, then you change. So right now you experiment with the breath. See what kind of breathing it feels best for the body, is easiest for the mind to pay attention to. And if the condition of the body changes and what felt comfortable for a while doesn't feel so comfortable anymore, you can change again. When my teacher, John Fuang, was teaching in Bangkok, he had a book that was written by his teacher, John Lee, which described the steps to breath meditation. They included being aware of the breath all the way in, all the way out, noticing what kind of breathing feels best, and also allowing a sense of ease whenever it develops with the breath to spread the body. In other words, you're talking to yourself about what kind of breathing is best, then answering your questions about what kind of breathing is best. And you keep on checking the answers so the mind and the breath get more snugly together. At the end of the instructions that Dana John Lee gave, he also described how breath meditation fits into the four levels of right concentration, what the Buddha calls jhana, which means absorption. There's always a temptation when you read that there are different levels of concentration to wonder, what level am I on? Where is my practice taking me? How far have I gone? How do I compare with other people? And John Fu never encouraged that. He would never answer people's questions about where they were. Instead, he would ask them, how does the breath feel? Is the mind consistently with the breath? If it's not, what's getting in the way? If the breath doesn't feel comfortable, how can you change it? So it does feel more soothing when the body needs to be soothed, energizing when it needs to be energized, relaxing when it's been too energized. In other words, he was encouraging people to observe things for themselves and put it into their own language. There was a Navy officer who was practicing meditation with him. And for a long time he had trouble getting his mind to settle down. And then one day he happened to be riding in a bus, and his mind just settled down naturally. And the adjective he used to describe his breathing was delicious. It felt really delicious to breathe in this way. So he mentioned this to a John Fuang, and from that point on, every time a John Fuang would teach him, he'd say, okay, now try to get back in touch with that delicious breath. The point being that it's how you observe things, how you note things, is really important. You don't need other people to certify you on this or that level. You just need to notice, is my mind calming down? Is it settling in? Does it feel comfortable here? 
Sometimes things outside the meditation are disturbing you. And you have to learn how to not be interested in those things outside. Years back, we had someone come here to meditate. He had been used to meditating indoors, in hermetically sealed environments. And here he came, and the first day after the, he came to meditate here, he complained that the orchard was so noisy. There was the sound of lizards running around through the leaves, insects in the air. Of course, it's up to you. Are these things going to disturb you or not? They don't have to. If the breath gets really interesting, there can be any number of lizards running around and they're not going to have an impact on your mind. So you realize it's not the sound outside that's a problem, it's the mind's interest in keeping track of sounds outside. But if you can make the breath interesting, your interest in things outside goes into the background. Thoughts about the past, thoughts about the future, the same sort of thing. They can come into the mind and either you latch on to them, in which case you lose your concentration, or you can just let them pass right through, like wind going through a screen on a window. The screen stays in place. The wind goes through. The screen is not disturbed. Try to develop that open quality in your own awareness. So you can stay with the breath, not let either things inside or outside get in the way. As your concentration deepens and outside disturbances no longer have much of an impact, you'll begin to see the way that you focus on the breath may not be as easeful as it could be. It's like a little child learning how to walk. You notice when the child is first walking. It's not really sure which muscles are necessary to walk and which ones are not, so it tends to tense up a lot of muscles that it doesn't have to tense up. But with practice, the child begins to realize, well, I don't have to tense up my arms so much, I don't have to tense up my back so much. And you notice that the child's walking gets more and more natural, more and more graceful. Well, in the same way with the meditation, when you first settle down, you're having to fight off You have to fight off distractions. And so the mind will have to tense up a little bit around the breath just to make sure that it stays, holds on. But as the distractions get less and less, you don't need to keep fighting things off. And that tension is, becomes a disturbance. In other words, there's a disturbance in the concentration itself. If you notice that, you can let it go. And after a while, the process of the mind talking to itself about the breath, you realize that's unnecessary too, because the mind is right here. And John Fuang's analogy is saying that you have a water buffalo, and you call the water buffalo to you. And as long as it's not there, you keep calling its name. But once it's come to you, you don't have to keep calling it. In other words, once the breath is settled in, the mind is settled in in the breath, you don't have to keep talking to yourself about the breath. Just have that perception of mind, just breath breath, breath, and that's enough. And the more you find that you can keep the mind still, but with less activity, the deeper the concentration goes, the more refreshing, the more energizing, the more solid it becomes. All because you've learned how to observe yourself. And it doesn't matter whether you're in the first jhana or the fourth jhana or the whatever jhana. What matters is you learn how to observe your own mind. Because after all, the problem that we're ultimately trying to solve is not that we're trying to get a certificate to say that we reach this or that level of concentration. We're trying to train the mind to see why it is that even though its actions are aimed at happiness and well-being, it manages to cause suffering for itself. When the Buddha set out the Four Noble Truths, the first truth was the truth of suffering. And he says, suffering is something you want to comprehend. That means you want to see it in action, exactly what is the suffering in the mind. And then you want to see the cause. Because if you're going to put an end to suffering, you have to attack the cause. And you're going to see that only if you learn to be really observant. 
and develop the qualities of mind that allow you to trust your observations. So these are the qualities you're developing as you stay with the breath. There's mindfulness, the ability to keep something in mind. Alertness, your ability to watch what you're doing as you're doing it and seeing the results. And then ardency, trying to be really good at this. It's in the ardency that your discernment develops. Because ordinarily you could be mindful of almost anything and would count as mindfulness. You could watch yourself doing things, no matter what you're doing, good or bad, and it would count as alertness. But ardency means that you're trying to do this well. And what's makes the, that's what makes the other qualities good. And it's developing these three qualities together that you become a more and more reliable observer of your own mind. So remember, that's what you're here for, not for a certificate. Because we're not suffering because we have a lower level of concentration than somebody else. Or if we are suffering from that, we're suffering from the wrong thing. The real thing we're suffering from is the fact that we're clinging to things that are going to disappoint us. And although there may be lots of other things outside that we say are causing us to suffer, it's really coming from within. So you have to learn how to observe from within, both when you're acting in ways that are causing suffering and then when you're acting in ways that are putting an end to that suffering. And so learning how to watch your mind as you're settling down into concentration is an important part of this training. Because you're seeing the subtle ways in which the mind creates unnecessary suffering, even around something as simple as watching the breath. Of course, suffering might be too strong a word. In Pali they use the word dukkha, which we translate as suffering, to mean anything from a slight disturbance to really heavy misery. So in this case, it'd be learning how to look for the slight disturbances in your mind and learning how to drop them. When you can detect them, then you have a good chance of seeing how it is that you cause yourself unnecessary suffering in other areas as well. So develop the qualities that allow you to be a good observer inside, a reliable observer inside. And as for where you are on the map of right concentration, that doesn't matter. What matters is that you learn how to see your mind in action and direct it in the direction where it's causing less and less stress, less and less suffering for itself. Because that's what the meditation is all about.